Okay, well, thank you for joining us for this presentation, Adaptations, Shifting States of Being. I'm Beverly Rayner, Director and Curator at Cabrillo Gallery. With me is my colleague, Victoria May, who is the Art Gallery Coordinator. Say hi, Vic. Hello, thank you for being here. And I'd like to quickly introduce our presenters. And each of you, as I said, please say hello when uh, I mention your name. Uh, first up, Angela Gleason. Hi. Next is Janet Fine. Hello, thanks for coming. <laughs> Carl Roars. Hi, everybody. There's a little delay, but oh, we didn't see Carl's face. Okay. Hello. I do. There he is. All right. And Greg Mettler. Hi, everyone. Did that work? <laughs> Hello. There we there he is. All right. Hi, Greg. Hello. And uh, Carmina Elias. Hi. Hello. Mm -hmm. Zoom lag. I don't know if everybody else is experiencing that, but okay. So let's get started. Um, every year, Cabrillo Gallery presents an art faculty exhibition. Sometimes it's a sabbatical show. Sometimes it's an exhibition that honors recent retirees. And, but most often, it's a group show of all faculty and staff. This year's um, faculty exhibition is titled Adaptations. So let's start that um, slideshow, Vic. <gasps> Okay, I just need to arrange some things on my screen and we can get going. All right. So there are over 30 artists in this exhibition who are staff or current or retired faculty in the art, photography and art history programs at Cabrillo College. Their work covers a wide range of media, disciplines and subjects, just like our arts program does. This exhibition gives our educators and support staff a chance to share their insights into their artistic practice with the Cabrillo students that they mentor and the community at large. Artists as creative people are natural problem solvers. We constantly find novel solutions to challenges that come up as we conceptualize and materialize our artwork. The artists in this exhibition who are also educators have had an extra complicated array of problems to solve since the pandemic hit. They had to adapt to teaching art online at the start of 2020, which was not easy. And now most of them are finding ways to adapt to returning safely to the classroom to teach in person again this semester. So they're definitely well-practiced in the art of making creative adaptations to the ever-changing circumstances we find ourselves facing these days. Next slide. If you'd like to see the adaptations exhibition, the exhibition is online only. You can see it on our website and Victoria has put the links uh, in this slide, but also she'll have them in the chat. And um, there are, you can also follow us on Instagram and Facebook. And Victoria does lovely posts for individual and groups of artworks for the show uh, weekly. I also wanna let you know what's coming up at the gallery. Our next exhibition, is moving Images, Pause, Restart, a juried online exhibition of video shorts. The juror is Clark Buckner. He's the director of Telematic Gallery and Media Arts Production in San Francisco. The online exhibition opens on October 4th. Clark will be presenting a juror's talk on Saturday, October 16th at four o'clock to offer, to offer his perspectives on the work in the exhibition all of which addresses the idea of restarting life with renewed purpose after being thrown off track by life-shaking events. The link to register is on the exhibition page on our website. Our final exhibition this semester is the ever popular 12 by 12 open invitational. Many of you are familiar with that, but if you're not, it's an open call and everyone is welcome to include their work in the show. We're hoping to have it in person in the gallery this year, we have our fingers crossed that forces beyond our control won't prevent that from happening again like they did last year. If you want to keep up with all of our programming, but you're not receiving our email newsletters, there's a form on our website homepage where you can subscribe to get all the latest updates on our gallery event exhibitions and talks. 
Today's talk is titled Adaptations, Shifting States of Being. This is the final of three artist talks for the Adaptations exhibition. A recording of the first talk is available to view on our website now, and the second talk, as well as this one, will also be posted there soon. In today's talk, five artists will discuss their work in the exhibition that explores the themes of identity and portraiture through representation, gesture, gesture symbolism, and storytelling. Their work reflects a variety of states of being that have all, affect all of humanity, freedom and longing, sense of place and purpose, questioning and frustration, self-reflection and acceptance. Next slide. And now I'd like to introduce our first artist, Angela Gleason. Angela has a Master of Fine Arts in Jewelry and Metal Smithing from Central Washington University in Ellensburg, Washington. She has been teaching a wide variety of sculpture, jewelry, and small metals classes at Cabrillo for 20 years. Take it away, Angela. Hey, thanks everybody. Um, I sort of feel like this is uh, how I spent my summer <laughs> or how COVID, how I got through COVID. Um, so the way that I work sometimes is I start with a very general idea and I had some free time this summer and I thought I'm really fascinated with ornamental iron. And so I decided to focus on just playing with techniques and I didn't really have a very strong idea, although it's a really great metaphor for life and being locked in and especially in COVID. So um, the, um, these are a pair of earrings that I made and where I was playing with, one of the things I noticed about ornamental iron is so rhythmic and perfect and repeating. It's like fancy gates. I take pictures of them all over the world. And so um, when I travel, so this was playing with the idea of being implying ornament, but being really crazy and a little bit wonky uh, rather than very symmetric and perfect. Um, and so next. Um, that led to, it was kind of interesting. I also was starting with the idea of just a face mask. I pictured a whole headpiece of the whole safety issues with COVID and the wearing a mask and maybe my mask needs jewelry. And so that eventually the ideas start taking over and they make, they make, they kind of direct me. So I started playing with really small ornamental gates and this is a brooch that's about mm, maybe three inches tall. And I ended up making these gates and I was still not really specific about what I was doing, but gates to me are they're meant to keep people out as well as keep people in. And so sometimes I think that the feeling of being locked in in a prison rather than a fortress to protect you. And so it was a lot about the emotions I was going through with this whole COVID lockdown and this feeling of being trapped, but yet also really excited to have time, open-ended time. So um, <clears throat> this one, um, the gates are closed. And I found this, while I was doing this process, I found these tin types this old tin type of two women who are in these really big dresses and they look really restricted and their gates are closed and they're safe. And that's the title of the piece. And um, it's copper and a photograph, the tin type, and it's a, a, a brooch. And these pieces, these are these pieces aren't in the Cabrillo show, but they're at a show down at Pajaro Valley Arts right now. And so then that led to the next piece. Um, and that one is called A Glimpse of Freedom. And I found this other photograph with these two women as well. And part of the, the idea of them having a little more freedom, they're laughing rather than being quite so staid. Of course, for a tin type, you have to hold still. So that might be why people looked so severe back then. Um, anyway, these two women are happy and smiling, but it's just a glimpse of freedom. The gates just barely opening. And it was, um, they're, they're still wearing dresses and being kind of proper, which is, my whole life, I would say, my adult life has really just been about freedom and about fighting for my freedom and your freedom and everybody who wants freedom and all the responsibility that goes with that is just fine with me and the consequences of having choices and being free. So this one was a glimpse of freedom. And then the next one, I went a little crazy and I, <laughs> I thought this is what freedom is to me is being in color and being uh, dressed crazy. And this is my partner, Shelly and I, and um, the gates are wide open and it's just sort of in their stairs that lead out. And um, that was kind of a fun process of taking that 
And it was kind of accidental at the end, the two first photographs led me to look for a photograph and I ended up finding this, Shelly found this great one of us, which is uh, Daniela and Kim have a plaid party on New Year's Day. And so anyway, it was just silly and playful and, and free and no dresses. <laughs> so next. And this was a piece along the way, I was also working when I, when I first had to teach in person, I was terrified. I thought I couldn't do it. So I took a class from someone else and I learned this tinkering process. And so it's a weaving process um, that Ellen Weiss taught me. And you're basically weaving a little basket, but I did it upside down so it could be a, a bird cage. And I, I've always thought the bird cages, um, the idea of a bird just kind of scares me. So um, in a cage, anyway. So this one is called Flight, and it was um, just sort of a celebration of the, the bird getting to escape, which is my, I'm voting for that. Um, and that's made out of silver, and it's a small, it's a necklace, it's only a couple inches tall, um, it's, it's quite wearable. Um, and then the last picture was what I originally started was to make a mask, and then at the, as the summer was winding up, I ended up grabbing all these pieces that I'd been making, and I made this piece, which is actually just um, much more of the traditional ornamental look, and that's copper wire as well. And um, it is called a listening device for a mansplainer. <laughs> and sort of my work usually has a lot of humor in it. And it has been difficult. Uh, first, the four years of uh, the last president were really hard to find anything that was humorous. And then COVID was hard to be I have a sense of humor. So and at the end, I was able to really tap into my sense of humor and <laughs> make this wearable piece that is a muzzle so that some people would maybe let other people talk and you could listen more. So that is what I did with my summer of 21. <laughs> Thanks. Good. Thank you, Angela. Do you have anything else? Nope, that's that's what I did with my, so I did make this too. This one's a, um, this is a necklace that would uh, ward off the evil eye, but it had a big eye in the middle. Nice. It was a very fun experiment and playful summer, so. That's great. It's nice to be able to um, play. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> Thank you. All right. All right, next up is Janet Fine. Janet has a BA in art with an emphasis on photography at UC Santa Cruz and did a fifth year there in the art program. She has been the Cabrillo Photography Department Lab Coordinator, yay Janet, for 24 years, and also teaches combined process photography. Take it away, Janet. Thanks, thanks Vic and Beverly for organizing a great show and um, these great talks. And thank you all for coming. Um, how many of you out there have had insomnia in the past year, two years, six years? It's been a hard time where it's kind of a battle of your mind. It plays a track and then you think, no, don't play that too depressing. And you try and change gears, but pretty soon you realize that every avenue leads downhill. So um, this is my ceiling now. I was lucky enough to land in my good friend's garage unit after being evicted last year. And these are the glow in the dark stars that came with my new digs. They are my nightscape if my eyes are open. When they are shut though, it bounces around from personal, like how can I afford a freaking home in this town that I love or to political, social, global, et cetera. I'm sure most of you know this drill. But when I'm lucky, art ideas float into my head like a lifeline and they pull me up out of this downward spiral. So this triptych came all a little bit angsty. Um, but on the upside, this summer, I was fortunate enough to teach my dream class, which Bev mentioned combined processes. It's a class I've been excitedly imagining for a while now, pre-COVID, and I put everything I had into it. And um, we had such a fabulous group of students and had so much fun. We played all summer. Um, but the piece of the show, Optic Nerves, is evidence of being inspired by teaching. And for those of you who aren't familiar with cyanotype in the piece, um, 
cyanotype is one of the oldest photo processes around and it's a liquid emulsion that you can paint on art paper, fabric, wood, and um, you expose it in the sun and um, rinse it in water. So it's very accessible. And um, here you can see, tone, you can tone it in tea or coffee. But basically here I am making a con, it's a contact negative, but you can also do a photogram and where the sun hits is bright blue and where the sun does not hit, it washes away to the white in the water. So um, here's the, another part of it. And it's really magical to wash it, wash, walk, wash it, wash. Um, I also was preparing for this class a bunch of paper uh, for them to try. And I was playing with uh, techniques of coating like splattering and brush strokes and dripping and um, so that my students could play. And I just fell in love with this blob, the dripping blob. It just, I just loved it. And um, it was the centerpiece of the piece in this show. And I just felt, it felt appropriate at a time when everything often felt like it was just breaking down, including me. So I really enjoyed that. Um, also at this time, I happened to get my eyes checked af after uh, my class and, um, they took pictures of my inner eye and showed me my optic nerve. And um, I thought they were fabulous pictures and begged them to email them to me. So I took my optic nerves and made them into uh, contact negatives to use for cyanotype and for this piece. And I like the metaphor, the nerves, the optic nerves just had a lot there for me. In preparing for the summer class, I also did a lecture on intro to cyanotype and I happened upon this example and I fell in love with the idea of combining drawing and cyanotype. And um, I'm very mixed media, but this was very exciting. So as soon as the class ended, I started this piece and working that way and I have more ideas in the hopper. I also fell in love with these little scientific filter papers that I had just sitting around. They take cyanotype super well. Um, and even are a little transparent. So you can see, I do a, I love doing double-sided cyanotypes. So um, you can kind of see two images at once and I thought they were beautiful. So I convinced, cajoled, encouraged my class to collaborate with me on a project, a blue circle project. And I coded a bunch of these filters and they were around and whenever folks had time or the inkling, they would make their own. And so it started, the installation is part way up but uh, just keep an eye out in the VAPA quad in the display case for the blue circle installation coming soon. But um, it, it was very fun. And so this just shows also a double-sided neg, me making a double-sided Ella Fitzgerald and ocean on the back. And I was just trying to show the magic of it washing and also wanted to show this because my mom is here and we both share a love for Ella. Um, so I thought I would throw her in. Um, so for this piece, I did so many iterations of these three panels and these are just the ones that I like the best, but it's kind of just the beginning of some new work. So um, thank you and nothing like a video to keep me in my five minutes. So thanks you guys. Thank you, Janet. And I'm so glad you found some joy this summer. You know, oh yeah. I did. Challenges, yeah. All right, thank you for that. So uh, next up is Carl Roars. Carl has a BA from Humboldt State University. Carl has been at Cabrillo for 37 years. I think he wins the prize. <laughs> he teaches graphic design and lettering and typography at Cabrillo, but he also teaches calligraphy workshops all around the world. He is a expert in calligraphy, and he's going to talk a bit about that today. All right, take it away, Carl. Okay. <clears throat> um, I uh, when I went to school, I was a regular art student, and I took everything two dimensional that was offered at Humboldt State, and uh, painting, photography, and printmaking. I started with printmaking, and uh, <clears throat> uh, I also took my first class in calligraphy, which at the time didn't seem so immense, but it became so later. It was just one of the things I was studying there. And when I got out of school, I, uh, I started to paint signs as a way to pay the bills as I waited to become a painter. And the most amazing thing happened was that um, 
I found that I fell in love with letters um, so much so that it just took care of all creative compulsions that I had. So painting signs and doing my calligraphy and exploring letters uh, became my pastime. And, and here 50 years later, I found that um, I will never be at the end of finding out what letters can do and the stories behind the design of letters and the people who make them and stuff. So it's, uh, uh, you know, it just took over my life. It was kind of a surprise, but uh, a really lovely one. So um, uh, this is the, the one piece that is in the show and it, it is brush calligraphy. The top is pointed brush and the uh, brown bottom letters are flat brush with uh, the shadows or the shades uh, were all put on with uh, a pointed brush. Uh, next, please. And uh, here's a quote by the same author, Christopher Moore, and this was a, a, a terrific book about painters. And um, so both the quotes are from that. And this is, uh, the piece is about six feet tall and the letters are very big and they're much more uh, rugged than what I used to do. And the reason for this is that I've developed a tremor in the last, oh, five or, five or so years. And, um, and the interesting thing is that not once has it caused me any consternation. I, I always just felt like it was something to adapt to. And, um, and it has changed my style. It's, it's loosened me up quite a bit. And I was always pretty freaking loose. So, um, so this is kind of welcome. Uh, next slide, please, Victoria. Uh, this is an older piece of pointed brush calligraphy. And you can see the delicate lines here uh, with pointed brush. The thicks and the thins happen by putting pressure on the brush and releasing that pressure for the fine lines. And that release of pressure is where my tremor really shows up. So the, uh, the connecting stroke from the O to the P, for instance, would be a wavy line at this point if I attempted something this fine. But I gotta say that, again, I'm still not that disturbed by it. It's just uh, um, art has always, for me, been a reactionary thing that you react to the situation, what you've made, what you've seen, you start to work. And so now that what I feel is a big part of it too, or the way, uh, what my actions are, uh, I feel like that is part of the challenge, part of the deal. Uh, so um, anyway, next slide is, uh, this is pen work. And of course I learned calligraphy with a pen first and it's not affecting, the tremor is not affecting that so much because I can lean on the pen I use very stiff pens. And uh, this is a letter style that is made up of multiple strokes to uh, make a, uh, the, the definition of calligraphy is that uh, a complex shape happens with one stroke of the pen or brush, uh, but these are a little bit more built up strokes. And um, uh, next slide, please. Uh, it's kind of based on, or this is my latest inspiration for working this way, even though I worked this way before I really got into this woman's work. This is Madeline, Madeline Dinkle, who is a uh, British calligrapher, um, 50s through the 90s, and uh, uh, very influential. And I, I'll show you a little bit more of her work uh, in a few minutes. Uh, next slide, please. So here's another uh, combination flat brush at the top and pointed brush at the bottom uh, combo. And this is multiple strokes with the uh, with the flat brush at the top, the, the word haiku. Uh, so even before I got lost in uh, Madeline's work, which really influenced the style of that pen piece, uh, I do like the idea of building things up with uh, calligraphy, um, which actually starts to take it out of the realm of calligraphy into lettering. Uh, but um, we'll refine that uh, definition when you take the lettering class next semester. Okay, next slide, please. But the, uh, a really surprising thing has happened in the last uh, six or seven years. I took over being the editor for the publication for the San Francisco Calligraphy Guild, the Friends of Calligraphy, and we put out a quarterly publication. And I've been editing and designing this now for the last, uh, I'm just starting my seventh year of that. And I'm just amazed at how much this has taken over my life. The um, uh, one of the things I should have said before is that no matter what's happening with the letters, there has to be a sense of design in everything you're doing. Every, all of us that 
are talking tonight and everybody that's watching, you know, uh, there's got to be a design consideration, no matter what kind of media you're working in. And, uh, you know, what was the thing I uh, see if it's, um, if there's no conscious design, it ain't all that fine. So the, the thing that's been great about this is the editing the magazine, I've been able to uh, do research much more deeply into artists and calligraphy events than I would have bothered with when it was just inspiration for my own work now that I'm writing the stories. And every page is, uh, of course, a design challenge. I uh, here, so those were the covers for the magazine and this is the uh, uh, one of the covers. Um, and so I'm getting to use design and photography as well as the editing. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this would be the title page for that same issue. Uh, the only calligraphy that I do in each issue is just the masthead reflecting the contents of uh, the, the magazine. One of the stories will influence a different masthead each time. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this was uh, from a trip to, to Rome where uh, a lot of ancient Roman carvings was the cover. And this is the wraparound. So the front covers on the right, the back covers on the left. And because it's not sold on a, uh, a newsstand, the masthead does not have to be top and you know on the front of the magazine. And I like to put it on the back a lot or low in the, on the front so that the artwork becomes the, uh, the thing that you see, the prominent thing. Uh, next slide, please. And this is, uh, and one of the big challenges when you're uh, with a lettering publication is that in most publications, the illustrations are pictures of other things, but in a lettering magazine, the, all the illustrations are lettering. So that is a different kind of challenge. And I've just uh, been uh, loving being submerged in the idea of creating uh, collages of lettering artists work uh, um, usually more simple than this, but this was a this is Madeline Dinkel's work again. Uh, so you can see how far ranging her uh, the scale of her work was, the scope of her work, um, and uh, that working on the magazine also led me to being the uh, chosen as one of the editors and the sole designer of the 25th edition of the Speedball Textbook, which is a a, a lettering publication that has been coming out since 1915, and um, is a 121 page book and uh, it was also enormously satisfying. So my COVID experience has been uh, partially writing and designing this book uh, as well as the, uh, the last five or six issues of the magazine. And it has nearly supplanted making letters uh, in uh, my interests. So that's my story. Thank you, Carl. I learned a lot. Uh, next up is Greg Mettler. Greg has a degree in biology with a minor in art from Humboldt State University. Really? And he has an MFA from photography, uh, in photography from San Jose State University. He's been an instructor at Cabrillo for 13 years. He teaches photography, video, and the history of photography. And he is the co-chair of the ph photography department. You're up next, Greg. Yes, Carl, I went to Humboldt. I heard you back there. So we have that in common. <laughs> uh, this image is the one that I submitted in the exhibition. And um, I wanted to pick something that was current, something that was kind of along the lines of the aesthetic that I've been working with lately. And this image goes along with a video that I created recently. Um, and I can talk about that real quick on the next slide, I think. So there's a video that I created that's composed entirely of cyanotypes and it's um, one minute long and it's about almost a thousand cyanotypes and um, I'll put a link in the chat so you guys can check it out if you want. But I'm having an exhibition in uh, February and so I have that black and white print, the first one you looked at, that goes along with this image. So I'm going to show all the cyanotypes and then there'll be a video installation where you can watch the moving cyanotype. And then the black and white image will be on the wall. So um, I shot it at the same time. And um, 
what's interesting about that black and white image, the first one I showed you, is it's actually kind of a style or an aesthetic that I was doing a really long time ago. Um, if we go to the next slide. So this is an image that I created when I was living in San Francisco um, after I finished undergrad, before I went to graduate school. And I was really interested in this low key type of photography with a complete black background. And what really appealed to me back then was that if the image is devoid of a surrounding, like a, a scene in the background, it feels more like uh, the mind space or my mind's eye. So a, a lot of the ways that I create photography is I'll envision an image in my head and then I'll create the image. Um, and that's different than some photographers who go out and look for something that's an inspiration for them. Uh, not one way is better than the other, really. You, different photographers, I mean, all artists work in different ways, but that was kind of my way of, of doing that. And then um, I worked a lot in this way. Um, you can go to the next image. With this black background with this low key, stark lighting, contrasty, emotional, black background. This one, I just envisioned this crying woman in my head. And then I got my friend Stacy to model for me and I photographed her. And then uh, when she looked at the image, she said that um, it reminded her of this story, La Llorona, which is like a Mexican ghost story about a crying mother. And then once I heard that, like I could not get away from the idea of La Llorona. So this print became entitled La Llorona. And I had a couple of exhibitions in San Francisco with all of this sort of work. And um, it was kind of primarily what I was doing. But then I went into graduate school and I shifted a lot in terms of the type of work that I created. Um, some projects were similar, but I think there was more of a push for public art and more of a push for um, color photography. And, and it was good for me because it allowed me to work in different ways in terms of my photography and think differently about my photography. Um, and I kind of moved away from this sort of thing. But then recently, I realized that I'm moving back to this sort of aesthetic again. And I'm not sure what it is. Um, over the last few years, it made me want to return to this black background and uh, this type of imagery. But um, maybe it's an, an emotional thing. So this is a new one that I've created in the last couple of years, but what it's do, I'm doing a little bit different with these is that these are uh, generally pretty large prints. They're about uh, 20 inches wide, but these ones, the image is in a metal frame and that metal frame is a wine barrel hoop and then the black and white image and then there's a resin, epoxy resin poured over the top of it to make the image look like it's underwater, like kind of creates this porthole. So again, I think it, it really emphasizes, it emphasizes this idea of a, of a mind's eye or and having these images that are devoid of time, but rather just thoughts, memories. Um, you can go to the next one. And this one is an ax. Um, and it, the, the first Im the image that I just showed and then this one and the next image hang as a triptych when I show them. And they're all about uh, my personal relationship to work. My family are all farmers. So um, uh, that relationship to work ethic and the idea of you know manliness being tied up into work, um, I'm not saying that's a good thing, but that's kind of the way it is in my family. And uh, this, you know, all those things related to that and the rope is part of that as well. That's what's uh, taken in our barn out in the country. So um, all these images are under epoxy. And then the last one I have here to show um, is the same one, but this one I made a little bit different. This one was made for the Shared Seas exhibition that was at the Radius Gallery, but it's also that, that epoxy resin with the image underneath it. And uh, I thought that the octopus worked really well in this porthole type um, imagery. So yeah, that's kind of uh, what I've been doing lately and what I'm interested in. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Greg. Uh, next up is Carmina Eliason. Carmina has a BA in cultural anthropology from CSU Monterey Bay and an MFA from 
in photography from San Jose State University. She's been at Cabrillo for four years and she teaches visual storytelling, digital photography and history of photography. Take it away, Carmina. Hello, um, I'm so excited to... Can, oh, everyone, sure. can everyone see that comment on, on the screen? Yeah. Just yes, on. yes, yes, yes. I'd like to take a moment to try to remove that. Yes, do it, thank you. Does anyone know, um, oops. How, okay, I'm gonna stop share for a moment. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for getting rid of it. It was really annoying. So with Zoom, you're always learning something new every time. It's like, okay, we have to figure out how she gets rid of it or how it got there. Nope. Sorry. So for me. Okay. Great. Good job, Vic. Woo, 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 woo. You did it. Thank you. All right. So, um, I so what we're what uh, Victoria is going to do is uh, play my piece in the background while I talk over it. Um, if you haven't gotten a chance to see this piece, it's a um, it's an audio narrative of. Uh, vignettes that I had written. I had started to write them when I was in grad school and the, the vignettes um, kind of talk about memories and uh, um, sensations of um, longing for um, my family in Mexico, but also kind of looking at uh, the past and, and the present and uh, the future and kind of blending in um, a bunch of different ideas about my relationship with, with Mexico, which is where my mother is from. Um, so um, the, the work itself um, includes a lot of different kinds of images that I've made in the past. And, and this is a new way of working for me because I tend to, when I make something, I tend to kind of work in um, one photo medium and that's kind of just, I just kind of keep it to that. Um, and in this, in this piece, I actually have a few different um, photo, uh, photo sources that I've used. So um, some of them are DSLR images, some of them are family snapshots, um, iPhone images. And um, each of these, uh, each of the sources, I feel like really impacted even how I thought about the piece. Um, for me, the DSLR, I, it's, it's something that I take out really intentionally and st strategically. And then in, in some of these images, um, they're iPhone images and they are, um, they're done in the spur of the moment. It's in a moment where I can't really take out my camera um, and really plan for something. It's just happening quickly. And that, uh, even that understanding of how like memory works and that kind of the graininess or out of context um, feelings that memory have, um, it, it worked, it worked with that. Um, but I wanted to kind of spend a little bit of time talking about, um, a process that is new for me. So when I was working on the piece and trying to thinking, I was thinking about places that I wanted to spend time in, in, in Mexico with my family. And I, um, I ended up, um, in a Google image search wormhole, um, because I was trying to find an image that reminded me of my family's neighborhoods and this idea of, of traveling. And so I actually ended up spending a lot of time, um, in Google Street um, and and basically navigating the streets and um, like taking walks and I would spend hours listening uh, to music I would uh, that I would listen to in Mexico with my family and taking these walks and I would click forward and backwards and I had this really weird experience where it felt like I was there like I would kind of like walk forward and then I'd walk backwards and like go and take a snapshot image um, doing a screen capture on my on my computer to um, to try to grab something that I um, that felt like like a photo I would take as if I was there, um, and so um, but it, it 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 was it was a really weird thing I think this summer just for for 
because I haven't been able to see my family in a couple of years and I don't know when I'm going to be able to see them next in Mexico to to kind of navigate these streets and like looking for particular things. Um, and so I kind of wanted to talk a little bit of some of the side discoveries that I made um, that aren't in the um, they're not in, in the video piece, but just some things that happened with my process over the summer. So in this image that's up right now, um, I was trying to find my grandmother's home and it's there, but in every time I went into Google search to find an image of her home, it would be blocked by something. And in this particular case, it's blocked by a tree, that little sapling. Um, but um, it was strange for me because I was watching this construction that wasn't there when I was a kid, but in the image, you can see that there's construction workers that are like peering into the lot where my grandmother's house is. And um, I remembered being a kid in that backyard and just thinking about this um, kind of this back and forth effect that I was having where I felt like I was in the future and then in the past at the same time. Um, so Vic, if you go to the next slide, um, in this slide, this is me in my cousin's arms at my first, my I think it's my two-year-old birthday party in, in Mexico. And this would be like the backyard that those construction workers are looking into. Um, so I was having this kind of, so I felt like I was traveling through time and going back and forth. Um, and then if you can go to the next slide. Um, so I was, I would take these, these kind of virtual walks through Google streets. And uh, in this, I came, I, uh, this one's a little, this one's kind of like hits me really in a funny place because I was walking and um, not walking, virtually walking, digitally walking. And I, I saw this gentleman sitting in front of his home and I had this sensation of like, that's my, that's my grandfather. And it's not my grandfather. Um, he passed away when I was really young, but there was something about seeing this gentleman in his chair and and um, and his hat that just it that's what my grandfather would do would kind of sit outside in the front, um, and and people would pass by or people would talk to him and that's that's how he spent his day and so seeing this image felt it was really striking for me and so it felt like somehow I was able to get a snapshot of a memory in in this really kind of weird way, um, and then this other thing would happen where if you've ever spent time doing exploring Google streets, you can move backwards and forwards through time. And this particular shot, I moved forwards through time. And uh, Victoria, if you could go to the next slide. So this is what it looked like four years later. Um, and to just watch that big contrast of like the those big trees being gone and, and whoever lived there has, is no longer there, vacated, concrete is, is um, blocking the windows. Um, and then if you go to the next slide, um, then it it's a basically a, a wall that a business has has taken up um, that particular uh, corner and then the ice cream store is still there um, and they've taken over part of the wall um, but I kind of I, I wanted to just show all of those because it it was um, it, it's a new it's a new process for me in working this way um, I, because I couldn't go and visit my family in Mexico um, the last couple of years and then um, that this ended up becoming my way of being able to kind of connect and be with them um, this year, but by by time traveling. So um, those are, I think those are those are the big highlights of what I wanted to share with you about my process. And I'm happy to um, talk more if anybody uh, wants to message me or email me. This is something it, I, I think will end up becoming um, uh, future future work. All right, thank you, Carmina. That was really interesting. I love the idea of where you really felt like you were walking through these spaces um, and referring to it as, as time travel. At the same time, you're traveling through space in a in a virtual way and traveling to through time back to your memories and impressions of Mexico. It's just beautiful. I'm looking forward to seeing more of it, and I really do recommend to all of you to go see the video um, in the show. It's really beautiful. Carmina talks over it. All right, well, thanks to all of you. That was really wonderful. Um, again, if you um, want to, you may visit the online exhibition at our website or follow us on Instagram and Facebook or subscribe and or subscribe to our email newsletter to keep up with what we're doing. And the links are all in the chat and on this slide, but easier to get to in the chat. All right, next slide. 
So now it's time for Q&A. So uh, you can feel free to either an, uh, enter questions into the chat if you don't wanna talk out loud or raise your hand and unmute yourself when you're called upon um, and, and speak your question out loud. And to unmute yourself, if you don't know how, there's a vertical row of dots in the upper right of your picture. Click on those and you will be able to click on unmute. All right, thank you very much. And um, we're gonna start up now with questions. Does anybody have a question? Uh, I do, um, Virginia. Uh, I just, uh, I didn't quite catch what, I, I think it was Janet when she was talking about um, cyanotypes, mixing it with drawing, that she referred to it with a, some kind of a title uh, of, a, of the name of the technique. What, what was that called? Um, oh, shoot. Dave, sorry. Um, we have two computers because our internet's not being great. Um, no, I didn't. It, there was no title. It's just that I like since you could do um, that you could do it on art paper um, that you can easily combine drawing and cyanotype in many ways. So. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have a question? So I have a question for you, Carl. Yeah. So uh, on the piece that's in the show, and I, I'm, I don't want to try quoting it myself because I can't really remember exactly what it says, but I, I know it has something to do with painters and being useless. So I was just wondering if the quote in the show has any special significance to you since you were hoping to be a painter when you went to college. Well, uh, no, but it, it did tie in when I started thinking about what we were going to talk about tonight. Uh, yeah, it was just, it was this great book by Christopher Moore um, and it was set in uh, late 19th century France. And this young man, young boy, Lucien, was hanging out with his father's friends, which were Pissarro and Toulouse-Lautrec and uh, lots of other artists. And uh, so Pissarro was saying, but we are artists. And Lautrec interrupted and said, therefore somewhat useless. So I, I just thought it was funny. That's great. And that, and that also that art, uh, that everything that we all do in our lives is ultimately meaningless. So you might as well throw yourself into it with all the passion you have, that everything is useless ultimately, I think. So, and that's a good thing. The, the existential di dilemma, isn't it? Yes. All right, Sandy, you had a question. You can unmute yourself. Thank you. Yeah, I was just curious, um, Angelo, about the size of your pieces. That was Shelby's question too. Angela, you're muted still. Um, they're about three inches, maybe. So they're like, they're big brooches. Uh, the pendant is maybe two and a half, three inches, the, the bird cage. So they're, they're sort of functional if you were in the mood to wear something a little big. <laughs> Thanks. All right, are there any other questions? You can raise your hand physically or raise your hand virtually with a little um, reactions button in, Canva, in the, the interface. So Carmina, get in touch with Jane Gregorius. She wants to do something with you. OK, um, Victoria, do you have any questions? Beverly, I think David was raising. Oh, hand. OK, I didn't see that. Go ahead, David. I did notice uh, Angela's artwork there. How long does it take to make those? They seem really small and sometimes in an outlier can be kind of tough. Um, so, I, and I understand it's art, so things can take a week, a month, a year, depending on what it is, but it seems pretty tough to bend that um, metal. So how, how did she actually do that as far as the process? Um, hmm. Yeah, time is pretty much not a factor when I mean yep. I don't make uh, I'm, I did have a few months in the summer so it was great and a lot of it's processed like I'm taking I actually if you saw it sideways it's like it's why I take really big wire and then I flatten it and then I curl it because I really like the idea of the line having that dimension and so hours but I also I bounce between pieces like I'm working on sometimes I'm just making little parts 
and then like I'd put them together and then they wouldn't become anything for a long time. So my desk is still covered with a lot of parts. So it was a couple of months of work to make those. And there were a few more pieces that aren't in the slideshow that I made, but it was, um, yeah, it was a few months. So it was a lot of, it was great. I mean, I just go work every day. It was so fun. <laughs> so you, you basically hand bent all of those. Cause I, I know someone who does yeah. something very similar and he just kind of plays with it and tries it out. But yeah. what he does is he puts nails in the pattern he wants on a board and then wraps and uses those as kind of a, a, a way yeah, to Yeah, jig. I didn't really use any jigs. I, I thought about it, but I, I get bored if I make the same thing too many times. <laughs> so if I had a jig and it was really easy to make, then I would be like, now what? You know. Yeah. So I, I, I'll get like, I'll make five of them or I, I'll, I'll set a goal. I'll be like, okay, I'm going to cut four inches pieces, eight of them, and I'm going to make this shape eight times. And so I would just bend it until they looked the same. Um, I would spend as much time making a jig and then I'd be moving on to something else anyway. But yeah, metal smiths a lot of times with blacksmithing, which is what the, the real iron work is called. Um, that they use jigs a lot. It's really kind of fun. I liked, uh, watched a lot of videos of blacksmiths and researched blacksmithing a lot in the process of getting ideas about how I wanted to approach this material. Because I hadn't really ever worked this way. And it was really kind of just, I was, starting out just pretty stuff, which is not normally how I think. Um, so it's kind of a challenge going, okay, I'm just going to make some pretty stuff and see what happens. And so it was fun. So you make part of it because they're, they're not all uniform. So basically you have yeah. one that's similar and another that's similar and you combine them together, but the, the dissimilarities are part of the artwork basically. Yeah. And, and when I wanted them to be similar, they pretty much were like the little gates. If you look at them, some of them are really similar and some of them are kind of rough. Yeah. yeah. It was fun, that yeah. part, yeah. And there's player marks and stuff like that. I'm... <laughs> That's part of it, I think, would be. Yeah. No, made no. by hand. I always say, I tell my students, it's like, if you're going to make something by hand, don't make it look like it was a machine. Yeah, uh, don't make it People think it was a machine and they won't even appreciate how hard the work was. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I have a question for Greg. Um, I think you put it in the chat, but can you tell us where your show is? You said you had a show coming up. Yeah, so I don't know if you know Sand City at all, but there's a, a little gallery called the Radius Gallery that was going for a while, and then they shut down, and now they're kind of reopened, and they're having some really cool shows. Um, and so, yeah, it's in Sand City, and the I think the best part about the gallery is it's right across the street from Post No Bills, which is like a beer tap house. <laughs> So uh, it's going to be, I think it'd be a really fun exhibition. And I'm not 100% sure yet, but San City has said if we wanted to, we could close off the block and have live music and stuff. So it maybe might be like a, a really fun, like Saturday night with beer and live music and artwork. So, um, but I'll make sure that to send that out throughout all the channels as that gets closer so everybody can come. So yes, yeah, Sylvan Gallery. And they have a show that's coming. Their next show is going to be the Temple Sisters. I'm sure a lot of you probably know them. Um, so that one's coming up and they had one, a really good show a few months ago with um, Andrew Jackson, the painter. And that was a really cool show. So they're doing a lot of fun stuff. I, I think San City is going to become the like not Carmel art scene in Monterey County. That would be nice. <laughs> so uh, Janet Shelby has a question for you. Um, love your new work and that is leading to more new work. Can you talk about that? <laughs> Thanks, Shelby. Um, yeah, it just was that I, I just haven't had, I was so excited to work on that piece right for this show. And, um, so it just felt like the beginning. Um, there's been a lot of kind of pictures in my head, but a lot of, uh, mi mixed media stuff that I've been inspired about, but I mean, I'm not sure exactly. Um, it's funny when Greg talked about different processes, like imagining something in your head, and making it happen or going out and being inspired. And I'm always thinking about that. And sometimes for me, it's halfway through with the process. So like starting with a process and that leading me down a uh, road and stuff. So anyway, uh, I just wanna play more, play more with the things that I've been thinking about, but um, sorry, I'm trying to, <laughs> my internet thinks, keeps being unstable. So I'm walking around and talking to you guys. But I did want to say to some of the people who are excited by my class that if you 
next summer take take my class we have a lot of fun so um some of you folks who wrote that in the chat elizabeth jane i saw come on down to play and we'll get angela this time was that enough shelby <laughs> It's definitely a lot of fun stuff, and yeah. Shannon is great to be around. And our lab <laughs> is fantastic. So, how can you not have a wonderful time? No kidding. Uh, Greg, can you say something else about something else about your cyanotype movie? How can we see it? So I put it in the chat, but if you just go to my website, which is www.gregmetler.com, so it's G-R-E-G-M-E-T-T-L-E-R. -E -E um, it's on my website. And then if you click on it, it just links to, it's up on the YouTube video and you can watch it that way. So you can watch it entirely. But I, and it looks cool on YouTube, I think, but I think when I made it, I really envisioned it being a video installation on a loop. So you kind of sit and absorb it because the figure comes out of the dark, out of the blue, and then he appears and then kind of goes back into the blue and kind of keeps and if you see it in a loop it'll just keep returning the going in and out you can watch like two or three times and then walk away and uh it kind of timed itself really well i think with covid this idea of like coming out of the darkness and then returning back to the darkness you know that wasn't my intention but i can't help but think of like an elderly gentleman like coming out of the dark and then returning the dark being kind of reminiscence of a covid spike or something yeah definitely and it's, uh, I know you put so many hours into that. It's just kind of insane. And I love that. <laughs> yeah, like a year and a half to make uh, one minute. Oh, wow. So but that's cool. interesting to see all of the, you said you're having enough, you're gonna have all the video, the um, cyanotypes that are in the video up on the walls. Yeah, like all thousand individual cyanotypes on the wall. So you can see it like from frame zero to frame, you know, 980 or whatever. And then you go, I'm envisioning, then you go around the corner and you can look at the installation of the work. I'm debating how to show it. I might actually project it on a giant piece of watercolor paper. I'm not sure if that'll be too literal or not, but I think it might look kind of cool. I'll just have to see. Great. Well, I'll buy you a beer for that that accomplishment. <laughs> uh, Carmina, um, speaking of what the, you know, might your work might lead to. You say you really want to pursue this more, and I can see how it could take you in all kinds of paths. Um, are you thinking of making more videos with it? I'm still I'm still figuring it out. I've um, I was explaining the idea of coming across the the older gentleman um, to a friend of mine and he was he he suggested well what if you like did a tour of the neighborhood and I was trying to kind of picture how that might how that might work because part of it is it's so personal to me you know I I'm I like I don't know that anybody else coming across that particular image if that would be meaningful for them um but the idea of um I, I keep want I keep wanting to go back. I had to cut myself off this summer from doing these uh, these street walks on, in in Monterrey on my computer because they were I would just like kind of keep going back and I kind of kept feeling like I was uh, that I was searching for something and I would I would go oh what about that place I went to that one time and so I would do it and I think part of it too is. Um, when I'm when I visit I'm not allowed to explore the city by myself my family won't they they have to go with me if they're go, if i'm going somewhere there there um that there is a bit of um an element of uh there there are kidnappings that sometimes happen so it's a big city and there's things and so they worry about me understandably um but i'm not allowed to navigate on my own which so it's interesting as an adult to actually be allowed to navigate via Google streets and I can see things and go go places that I wouldn't have been able to to just do by myself. So um, this, I think I thought about maybe journaling or um, kind of continuing with the snapshots or looking for particular things and kind of seeing what happens um, on these like self self guided tours of the city. Mm -hmm. Yeah, interesting. And I don't know if you saw Greg, but um, Carl, um, in stark contrast, all the time you put into that video has made the uh, question, uh, is there a cyanotype filter for the iPhone? <laughs> so, I'm sure, I'm sure there is. can laugh at that. 